But I want us to finish up something we, we started talking about uh, uh, last week, and that was uh, uh, in chapter 3, Haman's plot. Haman is a right-hand man to Xerxes. And Xerxes the king, and he, he ruled for 21 years. And, uh, but he has this guy who has managed to wiggle his way into some prominence uh, in leadership in the, uh, the Persian Empire, and his name is Haman. And Haman is full of himself. Uh, that's the best way to say it and understand. He's just full of himself. And so he gets uh, moved up above all the other leaders in uh, his field. To the, uh, he kind of gets moved up to the right hand of the king. And so he gets the king to uh, declare that everybody, when Haman comes by, everybody's supposed to bow down to him like he's almost like he's the same status as the king. And so he's moving past the palace gates one day. Mordecai evidently came and, and sat near the, uh, the, the gates of the palace, maybe to find out and kind of overhear things that were going on. We don't know for sure. Um, but Mordecai is sitting at the gate of the palace, and Haman comes by, and everybody bows down to Haman except for Mordecai. And uh, Mordecai refuses, and Haman, it, uh, uh, Haman, that doesn't set very well with Haman, again, because he's full of himself, he's proud of himself, and, and Mordecai refuses to bow down, which, by the way, wasn't because Mordecai didn't like Haman. He really didn't know Haman. Why do you think Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman? He wasn't God. And uh, the Orthodox uh, Jews would not bow the knee uh, to anybody but God. You remember that's what got Daniel in trouble, wasn't it? And it's what got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in trouble because they would not bow down to uh, any... Uh, God with a small g or human, uh, the only God they would bow to was God Jehovah. And so uh, th this makes Haman so mad that he decides we're going to wipe out the entire nation of Israel. That's not the first time that's, tried, uh, that's, that's happened, is it, or attempted. And he wants to, to wipe them out. He finds out that Haman's a Jew, and so the Jews really, remember, had been brought under this empire by captivity, though they had been granted freedom to worship and live and, and operate. But So Haman says, we need to get rid of them. They're, they're just trouble. And so he goes to the king, and he tells the king about this rogue group of people that uh, live in the land, and he says, we need to deal with them. And so the king, uh, Haman was a smoozer. And so the king tells Haman, look, you do whatever you want to do, and not only that, I'll, I'll put money in, in the bank to help you do it. Uh, and so Haman writes up this order, kill him, take him out. And then he gets the king to stamp it and approve it. And in the laws of the Medes and the Persian, once the king had authorized a law, it could not be revoked. Nobody could revoke it. It, it. The king couldn't even come back and say, yeah, yeah, no, I was drunk when I stamped that. He could, uh, there's nothing. It, it was a law, and you couldn't, it could not be undone. So the only way they countered laws was to be to make another law that essentially another law kind of uh, undid a previous law. So they got this law now, and the king kind of backs away. He says, do, what, you know, do whatever you want. The law goes out through all of the land to all the provinces. And all the local authorities are, uh, are given the task of wiping these Jewish people out on a, on a certain date. Now, the reason there was a certain date, it was about a year from the time the decree uh, was made a law. So what took them so long? Most scholars believe that Haman was saying, get out of Dodge. Because this would have been a lot of people to execute. So he's essentially saying, you got, you got until such and such a date to get out of town. If you, if you leave the country and everything, then you'll, you'll be spared. But if you stay, uh, you'll be killed. 
And so at any rate, uh, they didn't leave. And, um, and so the, the, the date is approaching. So in chapter 3, what we did, really the whole thing is I told you about the plot. And verse 1 is uh, Haman's elevation. Uh, verse 2 was Haman's adulation. That was, you know, where they, they all bowed down uh, to him. Uh, and number 3 was Mo- Mordecai's provocation. We said he provoked Haman because he wouldn't bow down to him. That's what made him mad. And then uh, tonight, uh, I want you to see Haman's retaliation. He retaliated. Where do we see that? Well, we see it in verse 10, uh, I mean verse 2, because of of, uh, uh, Mordecai not bowing down. But look more specifically in in verse 6. But he uh, disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. In other words, I'm not just going to take this out on Mordecai. So, as they made, uh, made known to him, the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, uh, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. That's Xerxes. And then verse uh, 9, look on down, it says, if it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. Now, here's what Haman says. I'm going to take the plunder. King, we'll, take, we'll plunder them and take thousands of what we would say dollars, and we'll put it into your treasury. And most scholars say that's what... That's what they were going to do. Now, we saw that happen in World War II. That's what Hitler did. He took the wealth of the Jews and put it into the uh, German coffers. And that's exactly what Haman is doing uh, right here. He's saying, and listen, king, if you'll let us do this, uh, let's wipe them out. We'll take all of their wealth and we'll put it into your treasuries. You know what the king turns around and does? He says, uh, he says, do what you need to do. And by the way, he said, basically, he said, and you can keep all the money. If you read on in the story, he said, you, you just keep it. So, but this is Haman's retaliation. He wants to wipe them out. Not, he wasn't satisfied to say, bring Mordecai to me and I'll deal with him. He said, I, Mordecai so provoked him that he said, I'm going to take the whole nation uh, of these people out. All right. Then we, we look on and we see uh, another thing. And, and we see what I call Xerxes' ab, uh, abrogation. What do we mean by that? He, look, look what it says. It says in verse 11, And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you. The people also, uh, so the money and the people, that, that's yours, do with them as it seems good to you. And then... The king's scribes were summoned to the, on the 13th day and first month and so on. What's going on here? By the way, let me spell that right. Uh, was he, when I mean abrogation, I, I mean the king abrogated his authority. He gave his own authority away. He gave it to Haman. This is, this is an example of the worst possible kind of leadership. He abrogated his responsibilities to a wicked man. Um, He shirked his responsibilities. He said, I'm going to let Haman do his thing. And by the way, the king didn't... Why is this abrogation? Because the king had no idea just what he was giving over to Haman. It's basically like, oh yeah, you do what you want. I, I don't care, do what you want. And so he gave up his responsibility as a leader. Now, there is a lesson there, isn't there, about a leader's responsibility. There are plenty of things that a leader uh, should delegate. And a leader can get themselves in trouble if they don't know how to delegate. But there are some things a leader better not delegate. Right? There are some things a leader must not delegate. Because if he does, the consequences of that kind of delegation could be catastrophic to the kingdom. Um, and so uh, somebody asked me recently in an interview, what's, 
my opinion, they, they ask me, uh, what do you believe is the most important thing that a leader has to do? What would you say? How would you answer that? <laughs> Lead. <laughs> okay. Uh, besides that, how would you answer that? Listen. I example. Delegate. What? Evaluate. Inspire. See the big picture. Sur surround yourself with good people. That's a huge one. Surround yourself with good people. I wish I'd lear learn how to do that. I can't get good people. I'm teasing. We've had God's bless us. What else? If you were asked that. Seek God. Yeah. Anything else? What well, may stun you, my answer may stun you. Those are great, and those are all true. My answer was, make decisions. I believe, after all of these years, I've come to believe that about 90% of leadership is making decisions, knowing how to make decisions, which would include a lot of what you just said, really, wouldn't it? The decision to delegate, the decision to seek God, the decision on, on the people that you bring uh, into the leadership circle and all those kinds of things. But I have come to believe, and, that, and that's what I said in the interview. I said, I think it is to make decisions. Because if you make the wrong ones, it doesn't matter a lot of times who you got around you, does it? And so uh, making the right decisions, I think, is a huge thing. Well, this is a case where the king abrogated his authority. Uh, he made the wrong decision. He made the wrong decision, and he gave this authority to Haman, okay? And then the last thing that I want you to see is down in verse 15. Well, let's just read on down there, verse 12. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month of the edict according to all that Haman commanded, okay? It was written uh, to the king's satraps and his governors. That's the rulers of all these uh, provinces and, uh, and to the officials and all the peoples and every province and... Uh, in its own script, in every people, in its own language, it was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. By the way, I just a little, a little trivia thing. I talk about this when I do wedding ceremonies. Do you know this is the idea from which we get the red wedding ring? Did y'all know that? The king's signet ring. Uh, in the... Um, the empire in the ancient empires the king had a signet ring we've all seen the expression of that and a contract or a covenant was only valid if the imprint of that unique ring was placed upon the document you know the wax would be heated up and the ring would be imprinted and that ring was unique so it wasn't like everybody had the king's ring and so if it had the king's seal, the king's ring imprint upon it, it validated the covenant. And it's from that heritage that we use the wedding ring. So a r wedding ring is the seal upon the covenant of marriage. Does that make sense? And so, so you see there, okay, once the king's imprint is placed upon the document, it is official and cannot be revoked. At that moment, it, can no, it cannot be revoked. And then look at verse, letters were sent, verse 13, by courage to all the king's province and instructions to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month. So it's about a year later from where the king decreed it. And uh, then verse, uh, and to plunder their goods. There's the money, okay? Take, take, take their goods. A copy of the document, I'm in verse 14, was to be issued as a decree in every province, proclamation to all people to be ready for that day. And then here's a, the last thing I want to point out to you in this chapter. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel, 
and the king and Haman's and uh, the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Susa's desperation. Uh, that's what I want you to see there. Sousa, uh, Susa's desperation. Um, the the city. Susa's the capital. This isn't the cities in all the provinces, but just this act alone threw the capital city into chaos because there were a lot of Jews there. And so they heard first. They learned first. And there's this sudden desperation. Um, now, you say, what's the application of that? Well, the application, I think, is this for us. Uh, man strategizes but only God's plans last. And here's what we know. You know, imagine this, and we're seeing some of this like we've never seen it before, and that is open hostility to Christianity in America. We've never seen this like we're seeing this. Um, I'm going to, at some point in time, write some things out. I've been working on for about two weeks um, called What to Expect in the next few years what to expect and i've been working on several pages of things what 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 should you expect uh, but we're seeing that kind of thing now if if for example if we suddenly heard uh, in one day suddenly all of a sudden it is announced that uh, christians can no longer meet together not because of covid just because uh, bible believing christians uh, are propagators of hate speech and by the way, that's been bantered about. And so suddenly, one day, we suddenly hear this edict that we can't meet, and that to do so would get you thrown in jail, or worst case scenario, completely destroyed, and even maybe uh, sometime subtly allowed to be victimized. There'd be desperation, wouldn't there? There'd be desperate. There'd be panic. Uh, and uh, there would be people, Christians, trying to say, what do we do? What do we do? Well, that's what happens here. And we say sometimes, oh, that stuff couldn't happen here. Listen, friend. If things don't change, that's where we're headed. Do y'all realize that? And we may get there faster than we've ever imagined before. Um, and so uh, you see that kind of desperation there. They're told you're about to lose your life. One day all is well. Life is good. You're raising your family. Uh, you're worshiping your God. And they could worship Jehovah God. They were allowed to freely worship. In fact, the synagogues were birthed out of this era. They were allowed to free the worth of God. And one day, now it had been in motion for a long time, but one day suddenly it is announced, all right, on such and such a day you're going to die. So they suddenly, they're thrown in desperation because they have maybe a year, but suddenly they've got, their, they've got their businesses, they've got their families, they've got grandkids, they, all of these things. And suddenly, they find out in a year we're all dying, including my kids and grandkids. That would create a little desperation, don't you think? That would throw us into confusion. That's what happened. Listen, never believe that it can't happen. You, we, we might have said, ask the Jews uh, in, in the uh, late 30s and the early 40s, Prior to that, would they have ever believed that something like this could repeat itself? And then it seemed like overnight they became the enemy of the state. And, of course, Hitler proposed what he called his final solution. His final solution was to wipe out the Jews. By the way, we're coming up on Memorial Day. I hope you read my column I, I put together about Memorial Day. I, I quote President Ronald Reagan's uh, 40th anniversary, uh, an excerpt from his 40th anniversary speech at Normandy. The 40th anniversary, absolutely incredible. 
And uh, so I hope you'll read that as we celebrate uh, Memorial Day weekend. And by the way, I'm going to preach a message entitled, But Blood Bought Freedom. Blood Bought Freedom. And, uh, but my column is entitled Two Memorial Days. There really are two Memorial Days, you know. So read, read the column. You'll find out what both of them are. But um, I had some guests here yesterday. Uh, some of you remember that I preached to a global conference back in March. Y'all remember that? The CLF conference, and I preached to, and, um, and, and so I got to know a couple of their uh, uh, senior staff through that process. Well, uh, one of them, the, the conference coordinator for the entire globe, uh, is a lady named Catherine Sue. She's a sweet uh, little lady. Uh, and she and her husband live in uh, Hawaii. And um, she, she coordinated everything there. Of course, you can do it now over, you know, over the Internet and everything, Zoom and all that. And so she told me after, after I had preached, she, she sent me an immediate message after I finished preaching. She said, Pastor Ray, she said, could I come and visit you? I said, well, Sure, I'd love to meet you if you're ever in South Alabama, Hawaii to South Alabama. And she said, I think I'm going to be there uh, later this year. And I said, well, if you get here, I'm still thinking right. If you get here, come and see. She said, I want to see you and meet you and see, see your church and that kind of stuff. So about two and a half weeks ago, I get an email from her. Pastor Ray, it's Catherine. Do you remember me? I said, yes. I, I, she said, I will be in Alabama in the week of May 24th. I wonder, could I stop by and meet you and see your church? And I said, well, yeah, come on. And so we set up a time that worked, you know. And so they, she showed up yesterday, but she didn't just show up. She brought a, a, a South Korean pastor and his wife who are pastoring a South Korean church in, in north of Atlanta and are part of the staff of this thing, and a, a young pastor, a Korean pastor from Memphis. And uh, so they all came, and uh, we had a wonderful, they're so sweet, and we had a wonderful time, uh, fellowship in my office, and uh, talking for, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half. And, um, and so I said, well, what brings you to South Alabama? You know, I'm trying to figure out how did, you know, I, they said, you. I said, well, yeah, but, I mean, why'd you come down here? I knew you just came by to visit me. They said, no, we wanted to meet you. And so I said, you came from Hawaii? That's what I did. You came from Hawaii? And she said, yes. And um, she said, we have a plaque for you. And um, I said, uh, she said, it, it's not ready, though. <laughs> she said, we wanted to deliver it personally. But she said, it's not ready, and it'll be shipped to you. I said, a plaque for what? And she said, for the session that you led for our conference. I said, you don't have to give me a plaque for that. I don't, I said, I, I, it was my honor to do that. You don't have to give me a, a plaque for that. They were so sweet. But this is where I'm going with that. They were so sweet. And they wanted to tour the facility, so I gave them the, the nickel tour. And uh, they wanted to see the, the TV studio where, where we shot the, the message is we have a TV. By the way, if you ever want to see it, just find one of our guys back there and say, could I, could I see the studio? And we'll take you downstairs and say that we can do all these different sets down there. Uh, and so at, at one point I'm giving the tour, I said, would y'all like to see the TV studio? And they said, oh, yes, yes, yes. She said, I kept looking in your office for the background from your session, and I couldn't see it. And I, was, I said, that's because it's downstairs. But I said, be careful and don't trip over the wires. When we go down the studio, you know, a studio in reality doesn't at all look like it does on television. It looks so together and everything. There are cables running everywhere, lights standing up, microphones all over the place. and everything. So, But when, when she said, I recognize that. It was over something sitting over in the corner. She said, Dad, I remember that sitting right there and that sort of thing. So, so it's just a wonderful visit. But I, that's a long way of, uh, of saying what I want to tell you. Because <coughs> it really has nothing to do with what I want to tell you. <laughs> 
Um, at one point in time, the young pastor from Memphis, his parents are from Korea, South Korea. And we were talking about the blood of Christ and freedom. And I said, you know, this is Memorial Day weekend, and the blood of many were give, w was spilled for our freedoms. And they said, and, and this older pastor and his wife who grew up in Korea, and he was a part of the South Korean army, and this young guy said, oh, we know our history, and we know what America did for us. And if it weren't for the American soldiers, he said, we would be a communist nation. He said, and, and, and he got choked up. And he said, and I got choked up. He said, if it weren't for the American soldiers, we would be a communist nation. And he said, you know what's bad about that? Our churches would never have existed. And he said, so many of us learned from American missionaries that were able to come because American, the American soldiers, he said, our army could have never withstood the communists, but the Americans. And you remember, we pushed back to the 38th parallel. And he, was, he just kept on saying, we love the American army, the American soldier. He just kept on saying that. And I said, we do too. Uh, but I thought, I isn't that cool that they recognize? And he said, so the and by the way, the work of God is strong in South Korea. There are some churches that dwarf American churches there. And, he's, and by the way, he said, uh, there, there's the senior leader of this, he said, he wants you to come to, North, uh, to South Korea next year for uh, a, spe a special meeting of pastors. And I said, well, uh, I said, maybe. maybe. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I was going somewhere related to what we're talking about. <laughs> and I don't know what it was. We only got two minutes anyway. Maybe I'll think of it by next week. I, I had a point for that, but I somewhere I lost it in the lengthy description of getting there uh, to the point. But... Uh, the blood that they were, we were talking about the blood in, in that case and the sacrifices uh, that were made that enabled the church. And um, I, I tell you what, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to even start Esther 4. We're really going to only focus on um, just a few verses there. But here's what, here, let me give you a little assignment between now and next Wednesday night. Would you read down, you can read the whole chapter if you want. We're going to talk about verses 12 through 17. But if you'll go ahead and read the first 11 verses, then we'll just kind of summarize those and jump right into the, the, um, the emphasis verses that I want to talk about. And this is the most famous passage in all of Esther, right here. This is the big one. You know it. Who knows that God has... Uh, uh, put you there for such a time as this. This is that passage, and I want to reveal and hopefully show some things and encourage you with them. And then I'm going to show you three lessons that we get uh, from this. I wish I could remember what I was going to tell you. It was good when I started, but I can't remember now. So uh, at any rate, do you have any questions about anything we've talked about tonight? Any comments? You got something percolating in you, Alan? I, I was very moved. I agree with you that this is covered on the end of three Esther, Esther, Esther. But a lesson to be learned from what you taught tonight, you spoke about one kind of persecution, another kind caused by our national disobedience, if you will. And please feel free to correct me. But I seem to remember Naaman there was a descendant of the Amalekites. Israel came in, they were supposed to totally annihilate the Amalekites. They were disobedient. So that's another yeah. reason he was getting back to the Jews. Did you did you hear that? Haman was a descendant of the Amalekites. And and Israel was told to totally destroy them, and they didn't. They made a treaty with them. And look, look, when God tells you to do something, do it. 
because there are consequences. All, somewhere there's always consequence for disobedience, right? Somewhere there's always consequence for disobedience. Uh, I think about the story, it's, that's, a, that's a really good example, the long-term consequence. I always think about when Saul took matters into his own hand. Do y'all remember the story? He was supposed to, um, to uh, wipe out the Amalekites, and uh, he was supposed to wait on uh, Samuel. He didn't wait on Samuel. He took matters in his own. He got ahead of God, but he had his instructions, but he didn't wipe them out completely and when Samuel questioned him <clears throat> he he said oh yeah we we have carried out the plans of the Lord and I love it because they were supposed to wipe out everything including the cattle and the sheep and all of that um, they weren't to keep any of the plunder or anything I mean they were to utterly then when it says utterly wipe out they were to utterly. and he said oh yeah we he tells Samuel oh yeah we have fulfilled the command of the Lord. And Samuel has this great line. He says, then why do I hear this bleeding of the sheep in my ear? If you did it, why are the sheep? And then give Saul credit. He was quick on his feet. He said, oh, those sheep. Um, oh, and those cattle. Oh, though, you're talking about those. He said, oh, uh, um, those we kept to offer as a sacrifice to God. Yeah, that's, what, that's why we did. Yeah. I mean, you, you see, he's caught. And so he spiritualizes his disobedience. The lesson there, isn't there? <laughs> if, if, if there's not supposed to be lowing and, and bleeding in the background, yeah, keep, yeah something's not right. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, Alan, I think that's a, a great point, is that uh, Haman should not have been a problem in the first place, right? But sin that isn't dealt with will show up again somewhere else, right? That's good insight. Thank you, guys. Anybody else have anything before we go?